Miriam Altaf. Yes. Welcome to the Queen E Show. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming down. It's a pleasure. So I want to talk to you all about what you do, mm -hmm. how you got into it, yeah. give people a little insight into your life and what you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like first off, I just want to know like what got you into law in the first place? I think as I was growing up, I used to watch like crime dramas and law programs and I had an interest for a long time so I think that's what did it for me really. My mum also used to say law was useful that even if you didn't want to go into it you'd know all your rights and you could get a good job no matter what after that so I thought I'd give it a go. Yeah. How long were you studying for? Oh wow the studying period was quite long because it's not just an average sort of degree type of situation as well as doing a law degree which takes three years on top of that you've got to do a legal practice course yeah um, it may have a different name now I did it quite some time ago they're always changing the name but it's basically a solicitor's course okay that I did part-time for two years then you have to do a further two years training once you get into a firm wow so if you add all that up that's an additional seven years and lot. even when you qualify you have to continue to do courses so yeah it's crazy it's yeah. crazy and um what got you into like criminal law i really enjoyed doing the criminal module in my law degree and my later lpc it was really really interesting i think crime interested me the most and i think it interests a lot of people yeah people like love crime programs prison programs people seem to have a real interest in all these things so yeah that's sure. what led me down that path okay and what firm are you with now i'm with a firm called carson k i joined okay. them in february 2018 so this year time's flown had to think about that they're based in central london and um, over there there's solicitors with their own following so okay it's a, yeah it's a cool firm it's a great firm and what kind in. of cases do you like deal with on a day to day? I deal with all general crime, but mainly serious crimes. So serious violence, drugs, firearms, gang related uh, crime and um, frauds. But yeah. All the bad stuff. All the bad stuff. All the, the bad scary stuff. stuff. I love it. I bet you have so many stories as well. I have stories for days. <laughs> I have stories for days. Obviously, I can't mention names. And yeah. There's a client confidentiality aspect. But yeah, I can sort of discuss the general nature of a case. So cool. They're always so interesting. It's so interesting. Like, yeah. I'm going to pick your brains yeah. so much. Um, there's something about the police station stage, right? What is so important about having a solicitor at that point? Well, firstly, it's very, well, it's very important, but everyone should know it's free of charge, regardless of your income or status. Everyone is entitled to free legal representation at the police station. Okay. And it's the most important part of a case. So you have to get that, that has to be dealt with correctly. If it's not, it can cause major complications in a case later on down the line. Yeah. I've heard people say so many times, oh, I wanted to get out of the way or I didn't want to bother you, it was late. You know, we have a 24 hour emergency number at my firm mm. where we cover the whole of the UK at any time of the day or night. So, and so do other firms. So, you know, whoever is being interviewed should have a solicitor there. They should know their legal rights. And yeah. it's very important. Wow, well, that's really interesting to me because I was a bit naughty back in the day, you know. Oh. And, um, there's been a few situations that, that I've been in and I've been like, no, I don't want a solicitor. And yeah. you just do the usual no comment, no comment. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's probably not the best thing to do actually looking back now. I think when you're young you think, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll be okay. But yeah. obviously you could get yourself into further trouble by saying the wrong thing. Or yeah. So it's Definitely. very interesting you, to you know. You could. And, you know, often people have said to me, oh, I'm just ringing you for an advice. I probably don't need you to come with me. I'm like, no, somebody is going to go with you. Yeah. You have to have someone with you. And then afterwards they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad someone came along. Because they think it's going to be a walk in the park. And yeah, of course. It's, a da it's not. It's a, it can be a very daunting situation, you know. So it's always best. If, you, if, you're, if you're able to have someone there, why not? Yeah. Exactly. Like May as well. People make sure you pick up the phone, don't deal with those situations. No, on your own. don't. Um, how can people get in contact with you? I'm on I'm 
easily contactable or via the internet. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Carson K's website. Um, I have my own client work mobile number, so you know they can contact me directly cool. or via email. So yeah, if they put in Miriam Altaf into Google, I'll be right there. I'm gonna put up all the deets, peeps, so if you wanna get in touch with Miriam, obviously please do so. Um, what types of cases um, do you assist with? So I can assist with all stages of the criminal process. Okay. Um, that ranges from the police station, the magistrate's court, the crown court um, and appeals. Uh, I also deal with, I'm able to deal with prison law and any issues with probation. So prison law is quite a specialist area. There's yeah, can various, you explain like, what is yeah, prison law? Yeah, there's various categories. So there's recategorization where prisoners are trying to lower their security category because for example, it starts at A for mm. the most serious crimes. When you get to D category, that means you've lowered your risk to a point you can go to an open prison. Okay. That's what a lot of prisoners are working towards. So, so cat A is like 23 hours in isolation and all that kind of jazz, well, and then it goes down? Well, is basically usually for serious crimes and long-term offences, so murder, terrorism, yeah. any sentences sort of... And it's also the type of offence, so it could be firearms. Um, so you usually categorise based on your offence, but they try to reduce their risk by doing courses, and in, by doing so they can reduce their category and try and get to an open prison, which enables them to leave prison two years earlier. Okay. Well, not leave it technically, they just have to sleep there. It's just like a halfway house, so okay. it's all about rehabilitation and getting them back into society and... Because you get like day reality. release and stuff towards the end yeah, of the Yeah, that's what you? it involves. So, okay. categorisation, complaints, general complaints, um, adjudications, parole hearings, licence recalls, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I mainly do serious crime, those are other areas I do, but um, crime is my main sort of thing. Yeah, it's so cool. And. Um, what was it that people need to know about communicating with people who are in prison? Because I didn't know this, and I must admit, not actually, I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we've all done I things maybe we shouldn't have done. I'd advise you like to silence at this point. <laughs> Don't make any disclosures. On no comment. <laughs> You're learning now. Obviously, people are in prison, they're desperate to speak to people. And yeah. Um, there's a, a large number of mobile phones that are now in prison. We all know this, it's not a secret and, you know, people use them and I don't think that that's going to change because it's very difficult to control at times in, in certain prisons. But under the, uh, the Prisons Communication Act, um, you're, it's illegal to communicate with somebody in prison who's right. using a mobile phone. So if you're found to be texting them or calling them, and vice versa, if they're called caught using a phone in prison, they can face extra time in prison for that. So they can, it's a, it's a brand new offence, they can be taken to court. People get an, can get up to 12 months, 18 months, six months. So that also in the reverse applies to people communicating with them outside. I so mean, how much time could you get for doing that? I'd say, you know, it can vary. It can really vary on the amount the, the amount of contact there's been. Mm. So it will it will be based on that. Um, it ha People are very rarely prosecuted for it, but it's okay. something everyone should be aware of. Hell yeah, I really, I didn't know that. And I think a lot of people watching probably don't even know that. So that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, obviously I say to my clients, ring me from the prison phone. There's yeah. a prison phone there. Um, and you know we can get into a lot of trouble speaking to clients on a mobile phone. It, we'd risk our job by doing yeah. it. It's just not worth it. It's crazy. Um, you know, so um, you have to be careful. I have to say, it doesn't happen very. I haven't heard of many prosecutions yeah. um, involving people on the outside, but I have heard that prisoners are now getting charged for possession of a mobile phone, which is unlawful in prison, it's gates of prison rules. Because you do see, like, not um, not to mention any names, boys, but um, you do see some Insta posts and some Snapchat posts. Oh my you know. goodness, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. Every, I'm sure everyone in prison has a phone at the moment. Well, not my clients, of course, but um, not everyone. But you know what I mean? It's just like 
I'm seeing all over social media, you know, footage in prisons. Yeah. And it's crazy. It Everyone seems to have a phone there. It's and they're crazy. having parties, they've got alcohol. I and know. It's like, what is going on? Honestly, it's madness. Yeah. It's madness. It is. Because um, we hear about it being so strict and everything, but then you see people in there and you think, wow, like, yeah. it, it's it's not as strict as it's I think not, what we're Well, I think it's a, it can be strict. It can be, depending on what prison you're in. Mm. But the problem is, is that they've cut a lot of funding. The government's cut a lot of funding into the criminal justice system. That means they've reduced police officers. They've reduced funding for prisons. That means reduce, reducing staff, closing down certain prisons. So there's a lot of pressure on the prison staff and they can't cope. Yeah, of course. So everyone's just kind of left to their own devices in some places because they just haven't got the staff for Wow, that's mad. Um, obviously you're known to do a lot of work with gang related kind of issues and music artists as well. We can't go into names. Um, what? What sort of what's the difference for someone in the public eye that's going through you know a court case or, or being prosecuted for something? With artists, obviously, there there's content. It's content. It's you know they're creating music. They're doing freestyles. Mm -hmm. They're on Instagram. They're on YouTube. They're on Link Up TV. They could be on Grind G R M Daily. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble is, if they're rapping about something that they are then accused of later, so for example, if they're rapping about making drugs and cooking in the kitchen and whipping and juggernauts <laughs> and jugging and, excuse me if I'm not saying it right, but um, that kind of thing, the police will now play these videos and these songs. In court. In court, I've seen them play them in police stations and it's a very awkward situation when, for example, I was in one interview and it was about county lines, which is where they say London boys go into different counties and run drugs lines there. Yeah. And some young young guys were involved that were sort of 16 years old in that investigation. They found that young boys were selling drugs from places. and. Okay in the freestyle that was then played that particular client was rapping about these things in a behind bars um okay. <laughs> uh, uh, freestyle yeah so it was um very the the content was very similar to the allegations that the police were making okay so that was so they're allowed to link that stuff situation to, that stuff together now then yeah they are they are and social media um videos you know instagram whereas life they they also look at lifestyle so yeah. for example if you're an artist and you haven't got a legitimate source of income and in your in, on your instagram you're wearing loads of designer clothing and you've got jewelry or you're traveling abroad to luxurious places or mm -hmm. just abroad in general, they will question that lifestyle and they will invite the court to, you know, make to make whatever to draw whatever judgment on their views on it. So they could say, Well, how have you got this lifestyle? you know, clearly you're involved in criminal activity. Mm. So that's another thing that they look at. That's that's another thing that often can affect artists. So their music can actually go against them in the end, mm. and all this flashy flashy on Instagram Absolutely. can also not be a good thing to do. I because mean, surrounded by money, mm -hmm. if if you're if you've got a lot of bling, if you're wearing like Rolex watches, AP watches, they're very high value items. Yeah, of course. So you know they'll invite the court or the jury to the prosecution might say, well, you know, make of it what you will. But this young man. You know, what do you do for a living then? And, you know, I rap or I go on stage. That's not going to get you that lifestyle unless you're at a serious level in yeah. music. So they can draw inferences from that. Wow, that's crazy. Um, do you listen to your client's music? Yes, I do. I um, When I represent somebody, I like to know everything about as much as I can about them because you know, I need to know what the police may know or the prosecution know or what the general public can see. So I do my research and yeah, if I like the music, it can go into my playlist. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. that. If I like it, it can go on the playlist, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, what effects do modern technology have 
in in life now with with um, law and stuff like that? Okay, well, that's an interesting question because it's dramatically changed the face of cases. I started working in crime in around around about two thousand and four. Okay. And at that time, you know, um, mobile phones weren't that advanced and CCTV wasn't that advanced. It was around, but not as as much as it is now. Mm. Um, I think it's dramatically increased. Um, there's now, there's AMPR as well, which yeah. is automatic number plate recognition. There's lots of cameras around the country. So if the police type in your number plate, they can tell where you've been at any given time of the day. Yeah. So regarding mobile phones for a start they can uh, the police can find out where you are at any given time using cell site information if your phone has gprs on it even if you don't have your location settings on yes they can okay. also um they can see the activity on your phone so who have you been calling who's been calling you yeah you know they may have a number for somebody and they're wondering who is that person and they'll look in your phone to see if you've had them got them stored in your contacts they'll then try and find out their name mm -hmm. there's with the mobile phones there's that issue now people seem to think that you know if they have these small phones or if they delete messages old that Nokia's old Nokia's the yeah they, they can retrieve everything deleted still. messages deleted wow. call lists and they can go back months and months and months. So, so is that stuff stored with the phone company or? Yeah, it is. And the police have access to it. They can request access to that. So, you know, forget, you know, your privacy and data protection. If the police want it, they will get it. Because obviously, you know, they're entitled to investigate crimes. So yeah, of course. They can re request that information. So whether it's a burner phone, whether it's some random person's phone, they yeah. can link everything. Because yeah. that's what's really interesting to me. I watched that Hunted program. Have you ever watched it? Celebrity okay. Hunted. I've heard about it. Yeah, but, but I these celebs, seen it. they'll like go on the run, right? And they use all of these things to find them. So they're like tracing the phones, and like they'll have a watch on like the mum's number and like the girlfriend's number, and then any random number that calls that number, they'll then trace that number, yeah. and then like the APNR hits and all that. It's, it's oh, just yeah. crazy. Yeah. So well, the CCTV everywhere. So often in cases you now see CCTV, it might capture some of the criminal activity or part of it, or you know something relevant. So yeah. that comes into play quite a lot. And the AMPR, obviously, again they can see where you are at any given time and track the movement of cars, which is often used in cases. And um, and even isn't it the cars that have the built-in sat navs now? They can tap into that, I believe, yeah, as well, yeah, which yeah. is just crazy yeah, definitely they can do do all that and i'm trying to think what else is often a, yeah social media it's now something that's featuring in cases a lot where they're taking pictures from instagram you know they can go on facebook i don't think do people still use facebook <laughs> I I usually they do. I've got a lot of school friends that still use Facebook, Aww. but I think Instagram is more... Yeah, Instagram is what I see in um, my cases more than any other social media site Yeah, where they're looking at pe what people are wearing, as I said previously, like jewellery, lifestyle, that kind of thing. Um, um, they're, they're also, if, if for example there's more than one, one person on a case and they're trying to connect them together, and they're, co they're called co-defendants, They'll look to see, are you following these people on social media? Are they following you? It's another way of showing the court that you are associated with certain people. Yeah. That you might later, that that maybe somebody's trying to deny. So. Wow. It's worth being aware of all that. Wow, wow, wow. This is so interesting, seriously. Yeah. Um, do your cases come into the media ever? Yeah, they've um, featured on Sky News, BBC News, National Press. Um, yeah, they're, they're often in the media. Mad. Yeah. Um, is your, like, obviously they're not allowed to mention names at that point, or they are, or...? When the trial is going on, um, they can, the press can report on it when a case is going on, but they can't... They can also mention names, but they have to do mutual reporting. Okay. So, um, you can't, they can't, they're not meant to, but you, you know what the press are like. Yeah. Uh, they're not meant to do biased reporting because you know they want the jury to be influenced by the evidence in the case and not media okay. media opinion and they don't want someone judged 
by you know have to have a media trial they want you to have a court trial so they can report as it goes on and then at the end if someone's convicted then they can they usually like completely annihilate them once they're convicted yeah yeah so then they can give their own personal opinions at that point yeah in the media i mean on a personal note um one thing that really bugs me i don't know if it bugs you too but you'll see like i don't know paedophile for example will come out of prison and their kind of life will be like protected they their, their names aren't allowed to be given they're given like a new identity and then you'll see like other people come out for like other crimes mm. maybe nowhere near as serious in my eyes anyway mm. and it's like their name their family's name where they live is just everywhere it's like why are they allowed to do that because I mean, not all paedophiles get that protection. Okay. Um, I know in the case of James Bolger, the, the young boys, um, well, they were young when they went into prison. The, boys, the two boys that killed him were later given new identities because they felt that they would be at extreme risk, yeah. um, you know, in the public. But there are certain cases in which that happens and um, they make a risk assessment and if they feel your safety is genuinely at risk mm. then they will provide you with that protection. So it's to do with your safety then? Your safety, As, yeah. Okay. They may even give you a new name, you know, new identity, yeah, basically given a new identity, secret location. Mad. But, um, you know, if you're a familiar face then somebody may recognise you, so... Yeah, so it does happen so to other people as well. It's not just, yeah. like I say, paedophiles that get protected like yeah. that. It can be anyone then. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, how did you form your client base? I've never been a duty solicitor, so I'm not on a rota or anything like that. All my cases come through recommendations. Okay. So, all through that. Amazing. Yeah, okay. so that's how I've built it up over the years. If you get good results, I guess people want to be represented by you. Yeah, I've got, but that's the best way, right? Word yeah. of mouth is the best. Definitely. Because people can stand for stand up for the fact that you've actually managed to do something for them in exactly. a good way rather than you just being called because you're on, your number's on a list type yeah. thing. Like, it's, yeah. it's much better. Definitely. Um, and then they automatically have that faith and trust in you and that confidence because your reputation precedes you kind of thing they already they already know about you so it's yeah. quite nice when so that happens cool. yeah and how do you balance life oh well i like to keep fit i go to the gym and you know i do boxing and i think it's important to if you're if you've got a lot of mental pressure through your job you keep physically fit mm. because that makes you mentally stronger as well so um, I, try, I, I make time for that and I think you have to have a healthy work-life balance, home-life balance. Otherwise, you know, your career takes over your whole life and everyone should be entitled to. Believe it or not, solicitors do have their own <laughs> life. Um, I think people just presume all I do is work. <laughs> but I don't. I actually, I actually have a life. Yeah. A very small one maybe but no I mean my clients are generally quite good they don't tend to disturb me in the evenings or weekends unless it's an emergency or obviously if they've been arrested of course I'm gonna you know be able to assist but yeah generally they contact me within office hours which helps okay it's nice That's so, cool. yeah. so you go out and let your hair down every I once do in a while. I do like to see my friends spend time with family you know and um, I think that is important you, you you need to balance it with anything everything there needs to be a he healthy balance there with everything yeah I definitely think. it must be a really stressful job as well yeah it is it, it can be very stressful and I think because I've been doing it a long time I've become used to that stress mm -hmm. and you just start taking it in your stride I mean don't get me wrong we all have like st stressful days where you're like oh my gosh can't wait for this day to be over but you know you can turn it around into a positive and it's character building and you know you're developing you, you develop in these situations so yeah you know it's just one of those things i think any job comes with stress any job but i really enjoy my job so it's just part and parcel of it so and how long can you be working on a case for like what's like the longest time um usually start to finish on an average case especially where people are in prison custody whatever you want to call it is six months because there's a thing called custody time limits which means that if somebody's in prison and you know they've got a court case going on it should be 
six months from start to finish okay so there are custody time limits that are given usually at the first crown court hearing so the court can create a timetable to work within those six months mm. that's if someone's going to trial if they plead guilty maybe two or three months on average for crown court matters okay and if they're not in prison or it's a very large case mm. For example, I've just dealt with a fraud involving nine defendants. My client was the only defendant that was acquitted. It was a million pound fraud that took place at Southwark Crown Court for about six weeks. Just finished yeah. last week. That case, because it was complex and it had a lot of defendants, I think that went on for over a year. And all the defendants, I believe all the, yeah, all the defendants were out on bail. So there weren't any custody time limits to comply with. Okay. So that's he it. He was finished. the only one acquitted. Uh, she. She. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was a great result. We worked very hard. I worked with a barrister who's absolutely brilliant and, and a good friend of mine, Peter Rowlands. Okay. He's fantastic guys. Garden Court Chambers. He's he's very well known for his results. Um, him and I worked very very hard to prove you know her innocence and justice prevailed Amazing. and the jury acquitted her i bet she was so happy she god. was over the moon that's she is over the moon i bet she is yeah god that's crazy yeah um, what advice can you give to people that might want to go down um the track you've taken um with law i would say it's not for the faint-hearted you have to work really hard you have to be dedicated you have to be committed focused consistent you have to like reading because <laughs> thousands and thousands of pages are involved with some some cases so there's a lot of reading throughout the studying period as well the period of study and after that so yeah you have to work hard you have to be dedicated like reading and be determined yeah okay. it's funny because when um when I was young before I left school and went to work I, I thought you know what I want to be a barrister right and this is what I wanted to do when I was younger. And then I looked at like how much it costs to to train. I wasn't in the best frame of mind at the time. So just the whole thought of just how long it took and, and then the pupillage after, you have to do like two years for free and yeah. stuff like that. And it's yeah. a lot. It is a lot. But then um, to meet you and hear what you do on a day to day and you know, speak to you about stuff that you're doing, I think it's so amazing and you know, it's it's really, really cool. And I kind of wish even though i'm really happy with what i'm doing now i do kind of wish maybe i'd taken it more seriously at the time because i think it's a really really cool thing to do no it is definitely cool i mean it was hard it, there were a lot of challenges in the sense that you study and then that's really challenging and then you've got more study i sent out my cvs to like a hundred different places and I didn't get a reply and it was heartbreaking <laughs> I was like all this studying and I can't even get a reply you know I thought everyone would want me I've got a law degree no one wanted me and I really had to go out there and just you have to you can't you can't let anything discourage you you have to be so determined like I thoroughly believe like whatever you want in life you can get mm. you just have to be committed and dedicated and determined yeah. So eventually I managed to um, get myself a job in a law firm. I wasn't actually in a criminal law firm, but it was better than nothing. But from there I went on to get a job at a in a criminal firm, but I had to work for free for six months. So when I went to the interview, they were what? like, well, this will be a non-remuneration position. I was like, what's that? <laughs> you know, little old me, <laughs> didn't get all these fancy words. And they were like, um... You know it's like work experience you have to prove yourself to us before we um take you on and i think they said three months in the beginning so after three months i worked really hard i used to stay there till like seven eight o'clock you know i was getting remember i'm not getting paid and i was still Boy. doing that i had to borrow i would not borrow i had to use my credit cards to get myself to work and back like i didn't have any money you know i've I, they wouldn't even pay for my petrol I'm not going to name that firm you're lucky <laughs> yeah um, so then after three months I went back to them and I said oh you know could I I've worked really hard you know could I get paid now and they're like yeah you've done really well but we still feel <laughs> like you need to prove yourself and I was like what I think I wanted to cry because I was thinking I can't keep like I'm pay I'm basically 
paying to work for you you yeah. know like, I'm in debt to come here but after three months you know they offered me and you guys are gonna laugh at this guess how much I was offered go on tell me this is 2004 I was offered 10,000 pounds a year my god 10,000 and you know all those dreams of being a rich lawyer they just suddenly trickled down the drain. that's when the tears came out I would imagine I was actually happy <laughs> I was happy for this 10,000 pounds bless me and I was willing to accept that and I think you know I then by doing so okay it was worth it because I then went to work for the third largest firm in the UK with the experience that I got from that firm. Yeah. There was a lady there and she said to me, how much do you, you work really hard. I was there one day at seven o'clock putting files away and she said, you work really hard, what, what do you earn? And I looked at her, I said, do you really want to know? She was a solicitor there and she said, yeah, I said nothing. She went, what? She said, well, I'm moving to another firm and I'd, I'd like to take an assistant with me from, I need an assistant and how, how do you feel about being my assistant? And I was like, oh my God. I was like, yes, please. And she's like, well, you get more than nothing. I can tell you that. And she took me there with her. And, you know, I did my training there. I I start, I created the prison law department there. They didn't have one. I created that. You know, I started generating about 15,000 pounds a month for that firm. Wow. You know, I then, you know, I qualified there. I got some really great experience there. I mean, in my first year I dealt with a double murder case and my second year there I dealt with a triple murder case like it's not always you know how long you've done it for or you know um how I don't know it's 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 difficult to define but basically from a young stage in my career I was dealing with very serious cases and that's enabled me to deal with the sort of cases that I'm dealing with now. Mm. I'm dealing with like a case involving 24 defendants in Liverpool at the moment. I just finished doing a fraud case involving nine defendants. Just finished a murder case uh, where my client was acquitted of murder. I've had three, um, in the last three years, I've had three consecutive wins on murder cases at the Old Bailey. <laughs> Um, which they're, they're tough cases to win. But I'm if telling you, if you're not sold, <laughs> you need to give this girl a call if you're in any kind of trouble. It's what I do. It's yeah. what I do, and I do it well. I care about my clients. I care about my cases. I know the law. I work with very good barristers. You know, I, you have to put a very good team together when you're about to take on a case. You got to know the most suitable barrister good communication skills good advocacy skills are they going to get on with your client is your client difficult mm -hmm. you know they're, they're you know you have to make judgments on you know will that barrister get on with, with that client if it's they're entitled to a QC I have to select the best QC I can that's available for the case so mm -hmm. you have to build a strong team as well and that's how you're, you, I mean, you become successful, I believe, if you're dedicated and committed and you do things wholeheartedly, mm. you know, and you're passionate about it, then yeah, for I sure. think you can get good results. Thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about this. It's the first Thank time we've ever kind of me. delved into something, you know, completely different and it's been yeah. really interesting. Yeah. There's millions of more questions that I could ask you, but for now, could you plug your social media and details to the camera so people can go follow you and check you out right now? Yep, I'm miriam.altaf on Instagram and um, we'll put a little snippet of that up we later. We shall do, yeah. And I'm, um, all my contact details will be um, put up after this so you can contact me for advice. Um, general advice is free, so cool. you know, if anyone's got any queries, feel free. Oh, and that was the last question I wanted to ask you actually. Is everything paid or is some of this legal aid or what is the situation with that? Oh, right, well, I deal with legally aided, uh, legally legal aid matters and private matters privately paid okay. so uh, when people say how much does it cost for your representation i do legal aid work um, which is um, assessed on your income so a lot of people are entitled to legal aid that i deal with okay. and some want to pay privately so i can do both cool yeah thank you so much Beth. thank you